Hi, this is Richard Sedlock. Welcome back to the Green Ninja course on climate science. This episode and the next one look at the critical energy crisis facing modern societies. It's commonly referred to as peak oil, but that's a misleading term that doesn't do justice to the complexity and seriousness of the situation. A much clearer name for what we're facing is the end of the age of easy oil. Let me introduce you to M. King Hubbard an outstanding multi-talented geologist who made many key contributions in his career. Among those contributions was the recognition that the production rate of oil from any source roughly resembles a bell curve over time. This observation applies at any scale, from an individual oil well, to an oil field made up of many wells, to a region with many oil fields. Early in the history of the source, the rate of production, that is the number of barrels that can be pumped out per day or per year, climbs steadily as the easy to produce oil is extracted. But at some time, the rate of production plateaus or peaks and then starts to decline. The diagram shows a hypothetical region where oil peaked. Note that the region is made up of a bunch of individual wells that also peaked. Because this curve is symmetrical, half of the available oil will have been produced when the production rate peaks. In the real world, a few curves are strictly symmetrical, but most of them are nearly symmetrical. We saw a version of this sort of curve for a North Sea oil field in episode 35. The term peak oil refers to the maximum production rate of petroleum for whatever area you're considering. If you hear the, hear the, term, uh, the term used currently in the media, they're almost certainly referring to global peak oil, in other words, the world's production of oil. And hey, a note about the term production. Humans don't produce oil the way they produce alarm clocks or iPhones or pickup trucks or widgets of any kind. They extract it after they find it. But the term production is the one used by the industry, so grumpily I will continue that usage, even though extract would more usefully contribute to human understanding of the reality of this finite natural resource. So let's reiterate. Peak oil doesn't mean we're running out of oil. In fact, if the production curve is symmetrical, it means we've only produced half of what's available. And most fields and wells have long drawn out, drawn out tails, aren't they're not symmetrical, so that at peak, slightly less than half has been pumped. So why worry? There's plenty left. The problem is that what's left is no longer easy to extract and therefore no longer inexpensive either. The growth of modern economies and the exponential growth of human population in the 20th century were possible because oil was easy to find and thus inexpensive. Given oil's crucial status, there's an alarmingly low level of public awareness and discourse about the end of easy oil and about what life will be like in a post-peak world. In 1956, M. King Hubbard predicted that oil production in the U.S. would peak in about 1970. He based his prediction on the production history up to that time and on the rate at which new oil fields were being discovered. His reasoning and conclusions were widely criticized throughout the oil industry and the media and were ignored by government officials here and elsewhere. The actual date of peak U.S. oil production was December of 1970. It took a few years of hindsight to verify that date, but once it was certain, Hubbard went from being a pariah to a celebrated prognosticator. The graph shows U.S. production from 1945 into the 21st century. The blue line shows the production from the lower 48 states, which is what Hubbard was working with. Notice the nice bell curve shape. The red curve shows overall U.S. production that includes Alaska. The Alaskan fields were discovered in the 1970s, and so they were unknown to Hubbard. You can see the Alaska production boosted national, uh, national production slightly, distorting the symmetry of the curve. But Alaskan production wasn't enough to delay the arrival of the peak, and in fact, Alaskan production has peaked. And since eight, 1986, overall U.S. production has steadily declined. It's sort of leveled out uh, in the last couple of years, but it's coming nowhere, can approach nowhere near what the peak was in 1970. In fact, we currently produce only about 50% of what we did in 1986. 
Well, let's look now at global oil production. In 1969, Hubbard published this figure. It shows two projected oil production curves for the world. The black one peaks in 1990. The blue one peaks in 2000. The two curves were calculated using two different published estimates of how much oil actually was available in the world. In 1974, he split the difference and suggested 1995 as the date of global peak oil, with the caveat, if present trends continue. But the present trends most definitely did not continue. From just about the time of his later projection into the early 1980s, the Arab oil embargo, the Iranian hostage crisis, and a severe global recession led to a significant decrease in oil consumption by the U.S. and the other non-OPEC nations. By the way, I've been using OPEC if it's familiar, but uh, if, in case it isn't, it stands for the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, which is a, a cartel of uh, the 12 uh, developing countries that are shown at the bottom of this slide. This curve shows global oil production from 1960 through 2003. From 1960 through about 1973, production climbed very rapidly. This was the later part of the age of easy oil. U.S. production was still increasing, at least until 1971, and no one talked about expensive gasoline or conservation measures. But note the changes from 1974 to 1982, brought about by the turmoil in the Middle East and a global recession. Oil was more expensive, and budgets were tighter for most households and governments, so consumption dropped. But from 1983 to 2003, consumption rose steadily again. The rate of increase was much less than in the 1960s and early 70s, suggesting that oil wasn't quite as easy to find and inexpensive as it had been. Still, increasing production helped fuel growing economies in China, India, and elsewhere, and, of course, the developed nations continued their consumption. And the production continued to increase right past Hubbard's projected peak, peak dates of 1990 and 2000. So he was wrong, right? Well, he was just a bit early. His estimates thrown off by the temporary decline in consumption in the 1970s. This multicolored curve is among the best evidence that peak oil has arrived. It's an important and complicated graph, so we'll examine it closely. First, the colors. The green shows the production, globally, of conventional crude oil. The light blue shows oil that was con uh, collected from natural, natural gas liquids, which I mentioned in episode 34. The red shows oil that was produced from biofuels and tar sands. Note the vertical axis on the right, which only goes down to 60 uh, million barrels a day. We're looking at only the top one-third of the graph. The other two-thirds are omitted because they're just solid green. It's all crude oil. Well, whether you look at just crude oil, the green, or the combination of all types of oil, global production has not really risen since early 2004. It's leveled off on what analysts call a bumpy plateau, with minor short-lived increases and decreases that don't hide the fact that production is no longer increasing regularly. The brown arrow points to the plateau in conventional oil production, and the purple arrow points to the plateau in total oil production. Superposed on this graph is a black line connecting small white dots. That's the average price of a barrel of oil on the world market. You can see that the price was 20 to $30 a barrel until 2004. Hmm. The price rose steadily in 2006, then spiked to almost $150 a barrel in mid-2008. The price of oil, and of almost everything else, plummeted in the global meltdown of late 2008 when the world economy almost came to a complete stop. But it started to rise again in 2009, and in both 2011 and 2012, it's again exceeded $100 a barrel. Now, the connection between supply of oil and the price of oil is complicated. But the shift from a steadily increasing supply to a supply plateau must have played an important role in the rising prices of the last decade. And you know, I'm going to pursue the significance of this graph even further. The term peak oil isn't very useful or even important. Industry apologists and conspiracy theorists can, can find cherry 
cherry-picked statistics that obscure the timing of the peak. But the exact timing of the peak doesn't matter. When you hear peak oil, substitute the words the end of the age of easy oil. It's impossible to make that cold reality disappear. But it's a lot more syllables, so I'll keep saying peak oil most of the time. The cold reality is that we face an energy future that's uncertain, but almost certainly uncomfortable. 94% of our transportation energy comes from oil, and no alternatives are ready to replace it. The most commonly envisaged or envisioned replacement, which would be electric vehicles, has seen some technological progress, but as you'll see in the next episode, only at a very small scale. It'll take at least a decade, and probably longer, to see a nationwide scaling up of the necessary production facilities, parts inventories and changing uh, charging stations, the retraining of service technicians, and our ability to generate sufficient electricity. In the meantime, anything that requires transportation will become more expensive. Uh, unless you live off-grid and produce most of your own food and clothing, that's pretty much everything in your lives. Surely, you might say, this should have been no surprise. Surely the powers that be, the oil industry, the government, the people in charge, someone or something could have seen this coming. Why don't we start preparing for this a couple of decades ago? This isn't the place for a discussion of political spinelessness and corporate greed, though they played major roles. Let's just say that for decades, economists, politicians, and oil companies ignored or rejected the concept of peak oil. They expected supply to continue to increase, at least for the next few decades, well past 2030. Whether due to the discovery of large currently unknown reserves or to augmented recovery from existing fields thanks to technological advances or to huge production increases of unconventional oil such as tar sands. Warnings about the end of cheap oil first arose from oil industry insiders in 1998 and have cascaded in the years since, but only in the last several years have the reality and significance of the end of cheap oil gained recognition in the mainstream media, throughout the internet, in politics, in military agencies, and in the marketplace. There's a lot of evidence that the age of easy oil has ended. We've already seen that global oil production has been on a sort of bumpy plateau since 2004. Here are 11 other observations that support that conclusion. Simply and undeniably, it's much harder and much more expensive to obtain oil now than it used to be. A century ago, a simple well might find a rich oil deposit a shallow distance below the surface. Fifty years ago, as demand for oil increased, the capital investment in infrastructure also increased, but the oil was still comparatively easy to obtain. Now, though, New prospects are offshore, they're in very deep water, they require fancy angled or horizontal drilling, or they require other expensive technological or computing tools, or, or two or more of the above. All the low-hanging fruit, the easy pickings, are gone. Lots of petroleum remains, but we've extracted so much by now that this remainder will be progressively more difficult and more expensive to extract. Oil and petroleum products will never again be as cheap and abundant as they used to be. We're way behind the curve in grasping this simple, inescapable truth. This graph shows that since 1986, the world has extracted or produced more oil than it discovers every year. By the early 1990s, we were extracting twice as much as we discover. Well, clearly such a trend isn't sustainable for long. On the bright side, this chart refers to conventional oil, not tar sands and oil shale and other unconventional fuels. On the dark side, unconventional oil is far more expensive to produce than conventional oil, and our consumption patterns will have to evolve accordingly. The world's giant oil fields, which supply humans with most of its oil, are declining. The decline is visible in two different measurements. The number of giant oil fields discovered, shown in the horizontal line pattern here, and the amount of oil reserves in those fields, which is shown in solid gray. Both quantities peaked in the 1960s and are currently at about 1 15th of what they were at peak. 
Extraction rates from conventional oil fields show rapid declines, despite the use of the latest technological tricks to coax more oil out with secondary and tertiary techniques. This cool chart on the left shows information for oil fields in the North Sea, which, as you can see on the map, is bounded by the UK, Denmark, and Norway. We'll view other charts like this one, so let's make sure you see how it works. The chart shows four different quantities. They're all labeled on the far left. The solid black line is the amount of oil those countries consumed. The red shows the oil that the countries imported. Green shows the oil that the countries exported. Gray shows the amount of oil extracted or produced by those countries. In the 1960s and early 1970s, the region had to import all of the oil that it used. So the red area and the dark black line are exact mirror images of each other. In 1975, the region started to produce oil. By 1982, they produced enough that they no longer needed to import oil. The red area ends in 1982. Since then, in fact, they've produced more than they use and have exported the extra. That's the green area. But North Sea production peaked at 6 million barrels a day in 2000 and is now down a lot. Because the region consumes over 3 million barrels a day, it's nearing the point at which it's going to have to import again. Here are similar diagrams for the countries of North America. Let's start with the U.S., which was the world's largest oil producer in the first half of the 20th century. U.S. consumption of oil was so high, however, that even by 1960, the U.S. had to import oil to supplement its domestic production. Since about 1993, over half of the oil used in the U.S. has been imported. In recent years, the U.S. has imported 60 to 65 percent of the oil that it uses. Two of the U.S.'s biggest suppliers are its immediate neighbors. Canadian production has increased significantly since 1990, allowing it to profitably export oil to the U.S. and to other countries. Mexican production boomed in the late 70s and early 80s, and for a 25-year period, the country exported about 2 million barrels a day, easily its chief money-making export. But as internal consumption increased within Mexico, as shown by the black line, and as production peaked and then started to decrease in 2005, as shown in gray, Mexican exports have declined very rapidly. We'll revisit Mexican production and exports shortly, but first let's look at one more example of the rapid decline of conventional oil fields. Indonesia was a founding member of OPEC, the oil country cartel. At its peak, it produced about 1.5 million barrels a day from 1975 to 2002. However, rapid population growth and development caused Indonesia to consume more and more oil. That black line shows a nearly constant rate of increase since the early 1970s. As a result, what they had available for exports decreased even while their production was steady at 1.5 million barrels a day. As production dropped off in the last decade, Indonesia changed from an oil exporter to an oil importer and is no longer a member of OPEC. We'll continue with the evidence for peak oil, I mean for the end of the age of easy oil, in episode 37.